Okay, good evening to one and all. We are thrilled to be able to gather virtually. We are very fortunate that so much of our programming has returned to in person, and yet at the same time, taking advantage of speakers around the country and around the globe and an opportunity to invite guests from outside of our community as well. We're so pleased to be able to gather this evening um, uh, and to learn together from our very special guest. Um, I'll say on a personal note, because there is that um, uh, strong Canadian presence here, you know, my congregants know that I am a proud alumnus of the Yeshiva University, uh, Beit Midrash Zichron Dov, uh, otherwise known as our uh, beloved Toronto Kolo. So it's really nice to see so many uh, Torontonians. It's been, a, it's been a while, but of course, only the fondest of memories. And I'm so glad that you are, are all able to join us from afar. Um, I will turn it over to the co-chair of our education committee and our sponsor this evening, Rivka Falk, in just a moment. But I would, I would introduce our program very briefly by saying uh, two things. Uh, the first is, um, as we all know, the season of, uh, of redemption and the story of the Jewish people uh, in Pesach is very much defined uh, by the acts of heroic women in the language of Chazal, Bishvil, Nashim, Tzidkaniyot, Nigalumi, Mitzrayim. And as we are in Pesach mode and thinking about Jewish education and thinking about Jewish spirituality and Jewish triumph, couldn't think of a more appropriate topic and a more appropriate presenter to lead us through this discussion of a truly heroic woman that has shaped the way that we experience Jewish life around the world uh, in our time. Our guest this evening is Naomi Seidman. She is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of the Arts in the Department of Study of Religion and the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. Her publications include Faithful Renderings, Jewish Christian Difference, and the Politics of Difference, The Marriage Plot, and of course this evening, uh, Sarah Schneer and the Beis Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, which won a National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies, and she is presently working, if I'm not mistaken, on the study of Freud in Hebrew and Yiddish translation, which I think we'll have to find another occasion to get together and discuss that, but we won't have time for it this evening. It's a tremendous honor for me and for our entire community to welcome you. We look forward to your presentation, but before we do, I'll turn it over to Rifka Falk. Rifka, you're still muted, sorry. I think someone, yeah, okay, got it. Thank you all for joining for this exciting lecture. Elliot and I dedicate this lecture to the memory of my mother, Miriam Gross, Rachel Miriam Bat Esther Vishraga Feisch. The connection between today's lecture and my mother is very direct. My mother was a Beis Yaakov student in Bratislava, or what is known in the Jewish community as Pressburg, the home of the Chatzam Sofer, in the late, late 1930s. My mother's time in Beis Yaakov was a sort of final idyllic period in her life. She always looked back at it both as formative years and also years of striking innocence and optimism before the terrible rupture of the Shoah. And yet, while so much about my mother's life changed in the intervening years, a mere 20 years after she attended Beis Yaakov in Czechoslovakia, my mother sent my older sister Esther and then me to another Beis Yaakov, this time Beis Yaakov of Barapark, which happens to be the same Beis Yaakov attended by Dr. Naomi Seidman, our esteemed speaker, and her sister Miriam Aleha Shalom, who was my childhood friend. If you'll indulge me, I want to tell you a little bit about my mother before handing over the microphone. My mother was born in 1922 in the city of Preshev in Czechoslovakia, really in charmed circumstances. Preshev was a beautiful city and the Jewish community of Preshev was a Kehila Mifo Eret, whose magnificent synagogue, and I've been there, it is magnificent, survives to this day as a testament to the community that was destroyed. It was between, it was uh, a very beautiful era between the two world wars when Czechoslovakia was a democratic nation under the leadership of President Thomas Masaryk, who was a great lover of Jews and my mother was always very patriotic. My mother was the youngest of five children and she was beautiful and a talented student. My grandfather was very active in the community. In particular, he held the trusted role of Gabay Tzedaka and my mother's maternal grandfather was one of the community's founders. My mother was a prize student, both in the Jewish school she attended and later in the public school. 
So when she finished her requisite education, she wanted to continue her secular studies in a gymnasium. My grandfather was reluctant and instead had the idea to have her continue her Jewish education at Beis Yaakov in Pressburg. This was a novel and elite suggestion as girls in Greater Hungary and Czechoslovakia generally received only a rudimentary education. It was considered adequate for girls to know how to read Hebrew, daven a little, and some basic Bible stories. But my mother wanted more, and so she seized the opportunity and traveled to Pressburg, which was a distant journey from her perspective. She was living in Eastern Slovakia and Pressburg was in Western Slovakia. She spent several years studying there with her favorite teacher, Chava Lonsberg. My mother thrived on classes in Chumash, Hebrew Bible, a Hebrew language, diktuk, Tanakh, and basic Jewish philosophy, and her great love, Jewish history. And there was also a breadth and openness to their surroundings. There was music in the air, and my mother learned not only Zmirot, but also how to sing Schubert Lieder and early Zionist Hebrew songs. And as a, an aside, I should mention that my mother had a most beautiful singing voice. And growing up, it was a delight to hear her sing those lovely Hebrew songs. I cannot tell you how much my mother valued her Beis Yaakov education throughout her life. Immediately after the war, during which she suffered the loss of her parents and most of her family, she and two of her Beis Yaakov classmates organized a Jewish education program for young Holocaust survivor girls in Budapest through Poale Agudat Yisrael. She was a beloved and inspiring teacher, while she herself was a 22-year-old orphan. Her education also undoubtedly influenced her courtship and marriage with my father. My father was a very learned Jewish intellectual, and my mother was his consummate partner. And she was ever proud of her Jewish knowledge and continued to learn Torah and read Jewish history throughout her life, and she encouraged us to do the same. I leave you with an image of my mother in advanced age. In their later years, their upper 80s and 90s, my parents would sit and learn together as chavrusas. And when they did, my mother especially gravitated, gravitated to learning Parshat HaShavua with Hirsch commentary, exactly as she had studied in Beis Yaakov. And when my father studied, suffered several strokes and struggled with speech, my mother was once again in her element as both Beis Yaakov's student and teacher, carefully making her way through the Parsha with her scholarly husband. They were truly a sight to behold. And now we will hear from Dr. Seidman, who I was fortunate to get to know recently. I fell in love with her boundless enthusiasm and excitement in the Beis Yaakov movement. And it kindled in me a renewed spirit and pride in my own education. Dr. Seidman. Thank you so much, Rivka. Really, um, it's funny, I, I say that every book in, introduces you to a new world. I mean, when you work on it, but also to new people. And this, and sometimes to renew acquaintance with old people and writing this book, um, in the course of writing this book, I interviewed my mother and I said that Sarah Schneer, who always talked about bringing the hearts of the daughters back to the mothers, in some way gave me something of that with my mother and also to my father, um, because my father actually wrote the first biography of Sarah Schneer, as I discovered only after I started researching my book. And um, but through you, Rivka, it's also, I've met so many wonderful people and interesting people and fascinating people who share obsessions with me. But through you, Rivka, I also feel connected with, with my sister, Miriam. So thank you for that. And um, I guess I, if it's okay to, to dedicate this to another person other than your mother, then I would like to dedicate it to my sister, Miriam. So, um, I'm just gonna share my screen. I have so much material I'm just gonna race through. If I'm not making any sense or I'm talking too fast or something, somebody unmute yourself and tell me that or ask a question. Um, I know I should try to get this down to a perfect, I don't know, 23 minutes, but I'm not 100% sure I can manage that. 
Um, here we go. So my title slide, this is my first slide. I start with this slide just because sometimes people ask me how I came around to writing a book about Beis Yaakov uh, quite a long time after having left Beis Yaakov myself um, and that world. And it happened because I took a group of students to Poland and I was actually in this courtyard and maybe some of you who've been to Krakow know that it, there's an amazing, I guess, 16th century courtyard, the courtyard, uh, the, the synagogue there, the synagogue of the Ramah, Rabbi Moses Isserlis, the, the, the Poles call him the Ramu. Um, and uh, I bumped into a group of Beis Yaakov girls who were visiting the grave of Sarah Schneer. And um, I found out, I subsequently found out that Sarah Schneer's yes. grave, grave site in, um, <laughs> in, um, in Krakow, which was rebuilt by Beis Yaakov girls in 2005, is now part of a kind of regular pilgrimage tour, which I think is only growing. And Sarah Schneer's yard site was actually exactly a month ago today. Today is, I believe, or maybe it's already Chafzayin, um, Adar Beis. And Sarah Schneer's yard site is Chafbav Adar Aleph. Um, she also died in a, a, a leap year. And what I discovered is that uh, groups of girls and women travel to Poland, sometimes explicitly, for instance, on Thursday, a group is going from Israel to visit the grave of a woman. Um, we know about the heritage tourism to where people go back to their hometowns. And we know about Hasidim going to the graves of the old synagogues of Hasidic Rebbe's. I think people don't yet realize that Orthodox women have their own culture and that part of this culture, which is I think only becoming more and more powerful as the years go by, is the veneration of a woman called Sarah Schneer um, who founded the school system um, that now exists all around the world that Rivka and I attended and many, many, many other women um, in the world. So um, how did this school system start? I think to really understand um, the need for it and the difficulties in founding the school, you have to understand the background against which um, Beis Yaakov was founded. And the um, I don't wanna talk about this too much because Rachel Manikin's amazing book just came out in the last year, um, The Rebellion of the Daughters. And it describes a wave of um, defections away from orthodoxy. So people leaving the orthodox world and most of these were girls from Hasidic homes and Krakow was a particular center of this defection. And why that is and why girls and why Krakow, I'm happy to answer all these questions um, in the Q&A, but um, for now, I'll just say that among the more shocking um, aspects of this is that girls were running away to go to the university, to become secular, to become Zionists. Um, some were also being caught up in um, what was called the international white slave trade, which was uh, the uh, basically sex traffic rings that were international in scope and that were not solely um, Jewish, but in which um, Jewish men and women, in other words, pimps and prostitutes were um, uh, Hasidic Jews or, or I guess formerly Hasidic Jews or traditional Jews, or maybe just, it's not entirely clear, we're still trying to figure this out, but maybe just um, girls from particularly traditional families were for various reasons, either actually overrepresented in these sex traffic rings or um, were just considered to be overrepresented. And there was a basically a worldwide uproar about this problem and um, which plays into Beis Yaakov history. This is probably one of the most surprising things I discovered in my research. Um, but one of the ways in which it plays into Beis Yaakov history is that the rabbi, sorry, that's such a bad print, but that's uh, an image of the first attempt for 
the or for rabbis from around the world to meet to discuss their shared um, concerns. And uh, very far on the high on the list of their concerns was this international white slave trade and the Chil Hashem, the desecration of God's name, of the involvement of Polish Jews in this particular uh, business, just you know, obviously had a lot to do with the immigration and the poverty of the day. Um, and the rabbis who met to discuss this, and the um, the conference was initiated by the chief rabbi, the Ashkenazic chief rabbi of Alexandria, who came from Egypt. Um, but he came to Krakow as a kind of center of orthodoxy and also a center of um, where these girls were running away from Hasidic homes in, um, including some very well publicized stories about the granddaughter of the Sansa Rebbe and things like that. And they came to discuss it and they found themselves um, coming up very, very quickly with the solution that we need to um, we need to educate Jewish girls. We need to attract them back to orthodoxy. We need to make orthodoxy more appealing for these girls. They even found a way around the well-known um, problem, halachic problem, which is that it says in the Talmud, there's one um, opinion by Rabbi Eliezer, I think it might be in the Mishnah actually, that says um, that you should not teach your girls Torah. It's like teaching them licen licentiousness. They took Maimonides' way around that, which is that um, the writ that refers only to the oral Torah, the Talmud, which is the kind of major staple of the male curriculum. Um, but girls could study the Bible and they can study the Bible with Rabbi Hirsch's uh, commentaries as they did in Beis Yaakov. And that was okay. So despite the fact that it was obvious that, that something needed to be done and despite the fact that these rabbis came up with what was gonna be the major halachic solution to the problem of girls Torah study, um, nothing was done. Um, there's a kind of uh, stasis of paralysis that comes out of a certain problem, which is that these men were trying to fight modernity, right? To fight secularism and Zionism and socialism. And, but they didn't wanna do it with what looked suspiciously like an innovation, or in other words, a modern tool. Um, and I think that was probably the main ideological barrier to their being able to go forward with the obvious solution. Um, this wasn't a problem for Sarah Schneer, this particular problem of trying to guard her right flank against, you know, th this is something that men within a, a, a rich and politically complicated Orthodox culture have to worry about. She was outside all those circles. And I think that helped her, uh, that helped her in, in her enterprises. I'll just say that on the right there is a picture of Bertha Pappenheim to show you that Beis Yaakov actually at the outset had both a lot of support from these rabbis, some of whom um, were there in 1903 and later became primary supporters of Beis Yaakov, even when they themselves felt powerless to make the change and a, a, a modern Orthodox, I guess it's not entirely clear, a, a somewhat observant, but also very worldly woman like Bertha Pappenheim, the German Jewish feminist who got involved with Beis Yaakov and was on the advisory board um, as part of the work that she was doing against the, the international white slave trade. So Beis Yaakov had a lot of support from sometimes surprising directions. And the big example I always say is Eleanor Roosevelt was on the advisory board. As a matter of fact, the, the London office of the Beis Yaakov movement had a, 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 an endorsement from Eleanor Roosevelt um, on the letterhead, which I think I might have a slide on. So, um, sorry, so this is a um, Sarah Schneer. I always feel very awkward about showing her image because she herself famously didn't want her her photo shown. I mean, sometimes that said it's because of modesty, but it was more because she was very self-conscious. She thought she was ugly, as she says in her diary, which has recently uh, surfaced. And so she, there was a kind of drawing of her that, that circulated in the end to our period that also was later a stamp um, on 
the Beis Yaakov material in Beis Yaakov in the land of Israel. But that's actually a photo of hers that surfaced from the archives about 15 years ago. And because I feel a little uncomfortable about showing her picture when I know how she felt, I do show it, but I show it very small. So who was Sarah Schneer? She was, a, 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 everyone talks about her as an, you know, a seamstress with an, eight, an eighth grade education, a divorced woman who had a, who was known as the divorcee, the gegeta on the streets of, of or the, the grisha, the, the divorcee, which is not a, a polite term really to refer to somebody as. So a kind of marginal figure um, who somehow through primarily her own efforts for the first few years, created a, 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 a flourishing school system almost entirely on her own um, for the first few years. I'll show you the map. That's the, it doesn't even show that in 1923 was when the Aguda, the, the, the political organization of Orthodox Jews that finally got off the ground seriously in 1923, um, when they made a movement at their, wor at their World Congress to adopt Beis Yaakov, it already had seven schools. Um, by the time they actually took over, which was in February of 1925, um, there were already 49 schools. So this is one woman with some financial support by a local, a group of local um, activists in, in Krakow, uh, managed to found 49 schools on her own. Um, how, um, and we have a little hint of what her methods were um, from various memoirs of people who met Sarah Schneer, who was already a larger than life figure in the interwar period. Um, and they describe what, what would happen is, is that there would be some scandal in a small town or a mid-sized town in somewhere in Poland. And someone would say, Sarah Schneer has been dealing with this you know, write Sarah Schneer. And Sarah Schneer would show up in the town with one of her students. And who are her students? Her students are basically her dressmaking apprentices and the daughters of her customers. So the teachers are the, the apprentices. And by 1923, they're already living in her apartment with her. Different accounts say different numbers, but somewhere between 25 and 50 girls living in a dressmaking studio and spending all their days learning how to sew from Sarah Schneer and uh, learning Torah um, through her kind of religious charisma. Um, girls from, you know, middle-class Balabatish families, as we say, who would, who would kind of live a life of poverty um, because of their attachment to Sarah Schneer. So Sarah Schneer would bring the oldest one of these girls, the memoirs say she would dress them up and put a high bun on their heads so they would look older than 14 or 15 as they sometimes were. And um, Sarah Schneer would come to the gathering of the town parents and she would say, how long will you sit idly by as your daughters leave you, as your daughters sit at the Shabbos table reading a Polish novel while you try to instill in them the, uh, the spirit of Shabbos. Um, and she would get them excited. And then she would say, if you agree, I will leave this young woman here She'll live with one of your families, one of the families that doesn't have a teenage boy in the house, of course, and she will start a school. Um, and not only that, but she will also start a school in the next town and find someone else to send um, to teach there. And the, then the girl would stand up and the girl would say, yes, I was like your daughters. I also just wanted to read novels. And then I met Sarah Schneer and I understood what Shabbos was. And I understood what God was, I understood what Torah was. Um, and suddenly this room full of parents would be listening not to a frumpy middle-aged woman, she wasn't that old, but she always, I think, looked older than she was, you know, tr a, a relic of the older generation, but would recognize the kind of charisma of a young girl saying these amazing things about Torah, which was completely, far into their expectations in a cultural environment in which so many girls were losing interest in, in Yiddishkeit. Um, so uh, uh, let me just, some, uh, so, so let me say one more thing about this particular um, graph, which I, is truly astonishing, right? Any, 
Any Ponzi schemer would be thrilled to know what Suresh Nera did. But um, what, one of the things you see is that in, 1950, in 1925, um, when the Aguda actually took over, when this, uh, let's say the male Orthodox establishment took over, the first thing they did is shut down operations. They were so freaked out at how, um, at how unhygienic the practices were and how unprofessional. And these were German Jewish educators brought in. Aguda was both Eastern European, Hasidic and Lithuanian heads of yeshiva and kind of more educated, more modern rabbi doctors. They were sometimes called from Germany. And because the rabbis in Eastern Europe basically considered themselves incapable of dealing with girls and women, many of them didn't even look at girls, they kind of outsourced the business to the Germans. So the Germans showed up in 1925 and were kind of horrified at what they saw and immediately actually tried to move the central office from Krakow to Warsaw. I think they basically wanted to get it away from Suresh Nera, who they openly called a cult, a, you know, a cult leader. Um, but nevertheless, four years later, the center is back in Krakow. Um, they can't, they cannot get rid of Sarge Nehrer, and it's, it's perfectly clear now why. It isn't just Basyakov girls that need Sarge Nehrer, it's also Yeshivat Maharat, and um, everybody needs Sarge Nehrer. Um, she was a person that was uh, necessary to, maybe the rabbis could wag their fingers at the girls. She understood what girls needed to hear to become enthusiastic about um, Torah. Beis Yaakov wasn't exactly a Baal Tshuva movement. In other words, these were girls who came from Orthodox homes for the most part, but in some sense, it was a movement of return to Orthodoxy. Okay, I'll keep racing through. Is that okay? Um, how are we doing? Here's a, a map. Uh, uh, please unmute yourself and say something if I'm talking too fast so you don't get what I'm saying. So here's a map of, um, I just, have to show this map because I love maps. Who doesn't, right? And by the time, um, this is already 1931, and you can see we're already talking about an international movement. By 1934, it's also in the land of Israel. By 1937, it's also in, in North America. Um, but by this point, it's already all over Poland. Romania, where my mother, my mother was from Romania. She went to school in Chernovitz, which where is that? Oh, you know, the map of Eastern Europe, still very mysterious to me, despite the fact that this is supposedly my field. Um, so um, this is what it looks like. And who did this map? It's those, I told you those German um, neo-Orthodox doctor rabbis, actually, who were, who were kind of the PR firm, who were the fundraisers. They were the, they, they professionalized Beis Yaakov. They raised funds for it. And they, they came on a trip in 1931 of the movement. And that's a picture of them in front of their um, hotel. They visited with Sarah Schneer. They visited the summer homes in Rabka. Um, they also, of course, met, you know, um, the Chafetz, well, yeah, 1931, the Chafetz Chaim was still alive. They met many other male leaders, but they also surveyed Beis Yaakov. Um, so what was Beis Yaakov? Um, it was many different things. Um, so, we, so I'll just say some of the many different things it was. Most Beis Yaakovs were just um, after school programs, often illegal, that some, as I said, 15 year old would go to a town and gather the local girls and find some little spot that they could spend time in after school two or three times a week. Um, and that's what you see. And girls would be sent from the seminary to found schools like this. Um, in some of the larger towns, um, you get full day schools. So what you see on the top right is the Beis Yaakov of Slonim, um, which had, uh, a, and you can see it says Kita Vav, I believe. And it's a rare um, inside of a classroom shot because I guess lighting was so bad. Most of the, even in the winter, the girls would have to go outside to take a photo as you can see on the left. Um, and what you see on the, on the bottom left is the Beis Yaakov of Panevish. And now we're already talking about a, a school with its own um, building and its own publicity postcard. This was a, a fundraising publicity postcard. And the fact that it's in, in Panevish is no coincidence. Um, 
it, uh, heads of yeshiva and uh, Hasidic rebbes lobbied to get Beis Yaakov's founded and built in there, you know, close to yeshivas, which is very funny because Rifka and I remember when they try to keep the boys and the girls separate, right, in the, from the, in the pizza stores. But in interwar Poland, the, the Russia yeshiva and the, the heads of the, the Hasidic sects were desperate for girls that they had too many bachelors. In other words, the marriage market was because of this wave of defection. Um, they were really eager to find um, brides willing to marry an Orthodox, a, a, you know, yeshiva bachar or a Hasidic man. And they um, uh, were happy to have high schools in their vicinity. Um, on the bottom right, I have a photo of a dressmaking um, class, uh, actually lace making. So that, that's worth saying just another minute about because first of all, um, Sarah herself was a dressmaker. And this is a period in which people just assume, I don't know what they assume when they hear that, but there's a lot to be said about that. For instance, um, this is a period of rapid industrialization especially, and Jews were especially um, active in the um, garment industry in Poland, just as they are in New York, were, are in New York. And factories were, um, let's say, hives of sexual transgression and Sabbath desecration. And despite the fact that even when, I mean, Poale Agudas Yisrael, the, the kind of more leftist socialist wing of, of the Aguda, which Rifka and I were talking about this morning, they tried to persuade the factory owners not to do these tricks so that they can keep their factories open on Shabbos. Um, that was one of their uh, messages to the Orthodox world. But so Sarah considered it a kind of, not only did girls need jobs, but they needed jobs that would take them out of the factories. And these were high-end, uh, well-paid, you know, these were compared to factory jobs. They were well-paid, but they required years of study. So she herself was, uh, you know, very interested in, in, in lace making, which is something she actually had in common with Bertha Pappenheim, who I showed you a few slides ago. By the, Bertha Pappenheim comes to Poland in the beginning of the 1930s to advise Sarah Schneerer and she says, you need to professionalize. It's not just teaching and dressmaking. So suddenly you get vocational training. That's really serious. You get, after Sarah Schneer's death, these schools are renamed Ohel Sarah in her honor, the tent of Sarah. There is one in Lodge that has about 300 students where girls study Judaic studies, but they also study to become bookkeepers, nurses, social workers, um, Etc. You could get a certificate and all kinds of things, and then also in Warsaw. And this was the wave of the future when Besiakov, you know, met the fate of Polish Jewry. Uh, the vocational training aspect of its programs were growing um, rapidly. So I'll just say one more thing about the culture of Besiakov. Um, Rabbi Zirkin, just give me how much time you want me to, because I should probably. As you could see, don't get me started, right? I told you. Let's say 15 minutes before the Q&A. Okay, thank you. So, um, so one of the things that characterized Beis Yaakov from the beginning until today, I just went to a Beis Yaakov play about two weeks ago. It was four hours long. Um, and uh, yeah, my research budget paid for the, the ticket. Um, and uh, the theater was a part of Beis Yaakov culture from the beginning and performance. Um, my sister Rechama, I remember I was so jealous that she was in a play. It was one way they attracted uh, girls, even from secular families, they would wanna be in a play and they persuade their parents to send them to Beis Yaakov. Um, Sarah Schneer herself was theater crazy in her youth, like many other young people in Poland in that period. Um, plays were a big part of the public school culture. And I actually have a, you might say, cra possibly crazy theory that if you look at the top left picture, that's actually not a picture of a Beis Yaakov play. That's a picture of a Polish Christmas nativity play. But if you look at the picture on the bottom left, that's a play performed and the plays were performed around Hanukkah. So this is a play in Buczac, my father's hometown. Um, and uh, it's obviously, I think, Joseph and his brothers, which was a staple of the Purimspiel and then the Beis Yaakov 
uh, repertoire. And um, it looks to me like those little girls could be wearing the same costumes in public school and then go to the Vesiaco play and, you know, be and uh, have the same stars. But that's just a theory. I don't know that for a fact. And just for those of you who don't know, um, this same sex uh, performance culture in which plays are performed by all female casts with female directors for all female audiences. You can see that that was the case in 1926. There's a, a poster that says, Eingang nor für Freuen, so entrance only for women. And I could tell you a lot of stories about boys who tried to sneak into the Besiakov play. Apparently that was like something that boys in small towns in Poland like to try to do. And since the girls are cross-dressing in these plays where they're playing Joseph and his 12 brothers and the boys are cross-dressing uh, as girls to get into the plays, the whole enterprise can be very strange. Anyway, this uh, same culture has only, as I said, only grown. And now you have not only plays, but films um, uh, for women only, some of which make it into film festivals. And in the 1930s, I read a newspaper article, which I believe was a joke, kind of like The Onion, maybe it was Purim Torah, that Besiakov was also gonna make a film. Um, but as far as I know, there is no Besiakov film from the interwar period, but if anyone finds it, I would like to see it. So um, what it, when, when uh, the German neo-Orthodox rabbi doctors showed up in Poland to try to you know, whip this uh, wild system into shape, they took over teacher training from Sarah Schneer and they set up four, four month professionalization classes that were in the uh, Tatra mountains in the south of Poland. Um, this is from a town called Rabka. You can see the postcard. They sent out a, 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 a Rosh Hashanah greeting, which is also a fundraising letter um, from Rabka. I think that was in 1923. Six, I believe, and teachers were brought from Germany to teach. And actually the picture on the left, um, the woman that you see standing up is not the teacher, but a, a, a student teacher, a, stu a student practicing to be a teacher. And the teacher is, I believe it's Tila Orleon, who's later Rebetzin Sarotskin. And the teacher brought in from Germany, who's all of 26 years old um, at this moment, or maybe even a little younger, maybe she's 24 this year, is the woman with the dark uh, sweater and the, um, and the white collar. His name is Judith Rosenbaum, later Grunfeld. Um, well known, especially in, in London Orthodox circles as the wife of Diane Gr Grunfeld. But in Besiakov, um, real royalty and known as the queen of Besiakov and uh, very beautiful and all of Besiakov girls from the memoirs had a crush on her. Uh, oh, maybe I'll just say one more thing, which is that these girls would spend four months together over the summer, and then they would be given an assignment to a small town. Do not pass go, do not go home, in other words, because if you go home, your parents are going to get you involved in a shidduch, and this, this Ponzi scheme known as Beis Yaakov is growing at such a rapid rate that we can't afford to lose anybody. So there was actually a rule that you couldn't go home in between um, your professionalization and your first uh, assignment. Um, in 1931, um, the, the famous teacher seminary was opened in Krakow, it still exists, funded mostly by American Jews who were willing to pay for a Beis Yaakov, but apparently couldn't sustain a Beis Yaakov movement themselves until Vichna Kaplan came in 1937 and opened the first Beis Yaakov in Williamsburg. Um, this, building, as I said, still stands. There's a plaque on it put up in, I think, 2001 or sometime around there. It's now a kosher catering hall, but it's also a little Beis Yaakov museum. And you can see some of the images of, um, you know, interwar Beis Yaakov on the walls. This is just an image I have from a family archive. I love it because most, most of the photos we have from the interwar period are one-offs, but this is the image of a uh, these are, this is from the family archive of someone named Devorah Cohen, Eppelgrad Cohn, 
who herself was in my eyelash. Who was in that uh, photo of Besyakov of Slonim? She's on the bottom row and the third from the right. That's her. That's her graduation photo. Um, then there's her in the middle is her diploma, and then is the is the trip that they took after graduation to the to the mountains, and there they are in you know at the lake that they were going to that they hiked to. And this was a long cart drive. Um, I'll just really quickly say Desyakov was also a youth movement founded in 1926 called Benos, Benos Agodas Yisrael. It was also starting in 1929, a women's movement, very closely affiliated with Desyakov, but officially the women's arm of Agodas Yisrael, known as Nishe Agodas Yisrael, which was, is the organization that's behind the memorials to Sarah Schneer and raising the gravestone um, that was destroyed in the Holocaust um, after Sarah Schneer died. Um, Desyakov also had a rich literature, a women's journal, and in fact, the few journals um, that ran 1923, sorry, that's a, mis that's a typo, 1923 to 1939, I think 156 issues. Um, in these issues, they paid a lot of stress to uh, having a female literary tradition. So they uh, like to publish women poets. Um, and this is probably the best known of the women poets of the interwar period, Mil Miriam Olenovur, who was a great favorite in Besyakov. Um, Besyakov, for maybe reasons that can be discerned already from this background, um, actually rebuilt itself um, amazingly quickly after the Holocaust and even to some extent managed to keep together during the Holocaust itself, including in Auschwitz, which is a complicated story that I won't tell, but these are Besyakovs just immediately after the war. These are orphan girls, and yet they had a network of their sisters, right? So all Besyakov girls, by virtue of being daughters of Sarashnerer, who, as they say in Besyakov, unfortunately never had children of her own, um, they are all sisters, and these sisters, despite so many of them being orphaned, came together in DP camps to found um, Kibbutzim um, or Beis Yaakov. My mother was in a, a Beis Yaakov in um, Ferenwald, where she met my father, and then in Paris, and many others. The, the photo on the bottom left is from Shanghai, which had a, um, a, a refugee community during the Holocaust. A uh, complicated story, mostly from Lithuanian yeshivas. Um, the one on the top left is the land of Israel, which saw an influx of first Holocaust refugees, orphan girls, often living collectively under a Beis Yaakov auspices, and then later refugees from um, Arab countries. Um, Beis Yaakov today is, uh, flourishes throughout the world, is only growing. Um, the Beis Yaakov that Rivka mentioned, Beis Yaakov of Borough Park, which I went to and she went to and many, many other people went to, it's been around for a long time, is on the top right. Um, the, on the middle right is Beis Yaakov of, of Montreal, another Beis Yaakov, I think in East Brooklyn, which has disappeared, Beis Yaakov of Toronto, Beis Yaakov of Detroit. There are at least 13 to two, uh, a conservative count which is one of the things I'm now trying to do is actually count how many Beis Yaakovs there are. And it's not always entirely clear what's a Beis Yaakov, what's not, but a conservative count is over 1300 um, Beis Yaakovs in over 10 countries. For instance, we know Buenos Aires has five Beis Yaakovs. Um, so Beis Yaakov, I'll just, coming to the end, I'll try to wrap up. I talked a little bit about the influence of German Jewry on Beis Yaakov. I won't say much more about it. German Jewish literature translated into Yiddish for Beis Yaakov girls, fundraising, etc. But Beis Yaakov was also certainly influenced by um, Hasidism. It came from a mostly Hasidic world. It instituted Hasidic practices like Sarah Schneer's pilgrimage to the grave of the Ramah, the same exact spot where I happened to meet those Beis Yaakov girls in 2010 in Krakow, um, and also nature hikes, a kind of 
pan Hasidic nature worship or nature theology. Uh, Sarshner loved nature and felt closest to God when on top of mountains, which required long hikes in the dark sometimes. Um, and here we have Desyakov in, in its collective memory of Sarshner. Um, I already talked about, I said we're exactly a month away from her yard site. Um, there are commemorations all around the world, and not only by Besyakov, but it's begun to um, spill over. Uh, I, I meant to include an image of the Polish comic book called Sara Imenu that was just published two months ago. Um, Sarasznera's memory extends far beyond Besyakov, but in Besyakov, it certainly is, is, is fervent. There you see tours to the seminary. On the, bot on the top right is Barclays Center in 2015, where thousands and thousands of Desyakov girls bust in from the New York area, all listen to speeches um, about Sarah Schneer and her accomplishments. So I'm gonna, I think that's my last slide. I'm gonna stop my share. And I'm very eager to hear any thoughts you might have about this phenomenon. Thank you for the beautiful presentation, uh, Professor Seidman. And I, as I said to you before we started, I know that this could go on for days and maybe it should, uh, but we're so happy that you're able to share that which you did. And I know there's gonna be a number of them. Um, I just maybe start with the first question and then remind everyone as you ask your questions to keep them brief and remember to mute yourself after you ask your question. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, you mentioned that uh, she didn't have any children of her own. Is there extended family of Sarah Schneer that are involved in the maintaining of her legacy? Very interesting. So Sarah Schneer had two husbands. Um, her first husband, Shmuel Nussbaum. I've recently heard from um, descendants of Shmuel Nussbaum who have a kind of odd connection to Sarah Schneer. But Sarsner also had um, two nieces that survived the Holocaust, um, one um, in Krakow, both of them from, so one of the things I didn't say is that Sarsner came from a family that was, she was already an outlier. She had two Hasidic brothers. She had eight siblings, two Hasidic brothers, one, I think kind of traditional religious brother, another traditional sister, and then a kind of a modern Orthodox sister. The rest of the family, totally secular. Um, and the ones who survived were the secular ones. I mean, the two nieces both came from the secular arm. I think that that's actually fairly typical. I don't know statistically. Um, the, one, the one that remained in Poland um, moved to Israel in the wave of immigration in 1968. And um, he died in 2012. And his father was Yaakov and he was interviewed and he said that he, in his family, the joke was they would see a base Yaakov and they'd go, oh, that's named after Sarah's brother Yaakov, um, which of course it wasn't, but that's a different point. Um, and her, she has, uh, so, so um, Tula, Naftali, Tula, Tula Schneer um, uh, had two daughters and both daughters are secular Israelis who feel immensely proud of their connection to Sarah Schneerer. And um, Sarah Schneerer's, um, they're her great nieces. Um, Michal Schneerer Avni's son um, took on the last name Schneerer. In other words, his mother's name rather than his father's name out of a connection to Sarah Schneer. So, but as far as I know, I, I've never actually met them, but they gave me permission to interview them. So as far as I know, they're, they're totally secular family that still has a, a strong connection that no one knows about, that they're not really talking about outside the family. Um, and I actually wanted to interview them again and publicize it, but they're very shy. So they got that from Sarah Schneer. They don't like to be on camera. So there's actually a perfect segue. One of the questions that was posed in the chat, I'll read uh, some of them to you, um, was how similar or different a story about Sara Schneer would you hear within the Beis Yaakov school, or for example, at one of the gatherings that you showed a picture of? I think the question is, you know, how do you hear the story being told as opposed to maybe the way you're telling it? And how has it been received? That's what a great question. I think, you know, that person has a guess that 
Sarsner's story isn't told entirely. In other words, Sarsner's story is carefully curated for Besiaco purposes today. Um, and what that means is certain things about even the fact that she was divorced is kind of known, but not really discussed. And when, when she's compared to Sara Imenu, our mother Sara, who was also barren, well, yeah, but Sara Imenu was barren and Sara Schneer was actually single and divorced. Um, so certain things are kind of fudged in that way. I don't know how, exactly how to put it, but, um, but you know, Sara Schneer herself was just, um, basically I, I discovered that I, I, I had an inkling that Sara Schneer wasn't exactly the person that I had been taught about in Beis Yaakov. And that was what led me to write the book, that she was more interesting and more complicated um, in many different ways. And uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, to answer that question fully would, would mean I would have to tell you my old book. I'm not trying to sell my book. You can go to the website and read it for free. And I'm sorry, my book is expensive. That's how academic books are. But um, yes, it's a, there's a huge, not huge, but there's a somewhat significant gap between Sarsner's story and the way it's portrayed, even though I don't mean to imply that Sarsner wasn't a, you know, immensely religious woman. She was just a religious woman of a kind of eccentric um, character. So maybe one other question that relates, and then again, if others wanna unmute themselves and, and participate or enter questions in the chat, you're welcome to do so. Can you talk Someone about the reception? That, that yeah, sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the reception of the book and maybe any surprises that you've uh, discovered since it was published? Yeah, so there were a lot of, I did. I had no idea, like when I was writing the book, I was, I was trying to decide whether I should say that I myself am no longer Orthodox and whether that would mean that I, no one would read my book. I wasn't sure whether, you know, I had, I had these like fantasies that I would be put in harem and then my books would sell for a thousand dollars a copy or something. I wasn't sure how to deal with that question. And, it, and then I figured everybody would find out it's a small world, maybe they already know. So I just wrote it in the first paragraph. And then I just was thinking, how was my family gonna accept it? How was my, how was the Orthodox world gonna accept it? And I think that I really, in some ways uh, was, was, was ungenerous in my suspicion that I would be banned or I don't know what. I've had nothing but, I mean, I'm sure there are people who don't like me or have, would like to cancel me or whatever it is, but mostly I, I, I have gotten nothing but, um, you know, I don't know, curiosity and tell me more and I wanna learn about it. I think my, my real respect for Sarah Schneer and my real interest in Beis Yaakov comes through. And I know my mother was nervous about this book. I mean, my previous books don't have anything to do with the Orthodox world. No one would bring it up in shul. And then my mother said, you know, oh, you know, the Rebetzin said she liked your book. So I got the kosh, I got the OU symbol, um, which isn't to say that my book is not, you know, in some ways edgy. It's not the kind of book that Art Scroll would write. And I really think that Orthodox Jews are, are, are eager for, let's say, non-apologetic, hyper-pious kind of books about their own history that use archives instead of just, I don't know what to call it, folklore. There's an interesting question was posted in the chat about if any research has been done on Sarah Schneer's theology herself in the vein of Hasidic Rebbe, like the kind of things that you talked about in the uh, earlier in the presentation, it sounds quite a bit like she had a role in the development of the Hasidic movement. Do you think she plays a role in the development of Hasidut and Judaism? Absolutely she does. And it's really time that we brought her back into, so Sarah Schneer came from a conservative, you know, Hasidic background in which it would not have been appropriate for anyone to say out loud that she was a Hasidic Rebbe. But when people talk about her as a Hasid, what she really was, was a Rebbe, and people came very close to saying it. I mean, without saying it, saying it without saying it. I mean, there are stories about, I don't know, the, the, the Chafetz Chaim would stand up when she walked into a room. The, um, she, she was treated, it, people said it openly in the secular press. And it was said below, and, and when she, and stories about, um, I have a section about Sarah Schneer and Hasidism where I talk about how 
the miracle stories about Sarah Schneer, there was one, um, there was a, a children's book basically telling stories about Sarah Schneer that might as well have been Shivre Habesh. It is totally in the style of, I mean, it's more modern because it's not, you know, whatever, 1816 or whenever Shivre Habesh was published, but it's, it's the, 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 the kind of Hasidic doctrines like going down in order to come up are applied by Sarah Schneer to her own activity. None of this, I think, is accidental. I'll just say one more thing, which is that the Hasidic movements, so uh, uh, Beis Yaakov was basically Ger. Uh, it was most closely associated with the Ger uh, Hasidic movement, which was the largest Hasidic movement into our Poland, a quarter of a million followers. Um, the Ger Rebbe was an early supporter of the Aguda. But the other Hasidic movements that didn't um, allow their daughters to go to Beis Yaakov had the same problems with girls going off the derech that they had in Krakow. And they realized that they needed to do something. And sure enough, that's what you see. You see um, um, the Lubavitch starting a school system for girls. You see um, in Munkach, where they called Beis Yaakov Beis Esau, the house of Esau, uh, Jacob's you know, evil twin. Um, they had Beis Yaakov, but they weren't, you couldn't call them Beis Yaakov, but they used Beis Yaakov teachers from Pressburg, which had a, a seminary, and right? So that's where they used, they took the, their teachers. And they were Beis Yaakovs for all intents and purposes, except you couldn't actually read from the Chumash. Professor Seidman, hi. Yeah. Um, I myself am a Beis Yaakov graduate, and I just wanted to tell you, I so enjoyed your presentation. And one of the things that you said that I just thought was so interesting, um, my school always had a very large stress on production, where we would practice for three months. And it was a, it was a play, and it was for women only, obviously. And it's so interesting, because I never understood the historical underpinnings of that. So it's fascinating hearing you talk about that. And something else you said that I thought was just very funny about... Um, how the men would dress up as the women and the women would dress up as men. There were always rumors of like local no neighborhood boys sneaking in, dress up as girls. So it's just, it's very funny, just, you know, how history repeats itself and just understanding um, how, how that was based on, you know, Polish culture and how theater was always so important. It was just really interesting. So thank you so much again. Oh, thank you. If you want to be interviewed by me, I'm writing another book about Beis Yaakov, actually about production. I don't know if it's going to be called production. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. I can I cannot uh, give you my email address. Okay, or, or find me on the University of Toronto um, uh, website. Sure. And somebody sure. just mentioned Elisa Besser Grund, who um, was the you know the uh, leader. I forget her exact title of Mishaya Godes Yisrael until she passed away um, pretty recently, maybe five years ago. Um, so I didn't quite catch what it was in the in the chat. So uh, thank you for mentioning her too. Very instrumental in developing uh, Beis Yaakov memory culture. Oh yes, hi Margie. Um, may I say? May I ask Please. something? I asked. Hi, you mentioned uh, Paul Aguda. That was my father's passion. Um, my father, I believe, knew your father. Um, my father, Shmuel Shik, and I believe he knew your of father. Course, and I'm not, yeah, course, yes. And, and they were friendly, and I think they were both intellectuals you know, of the old school. Uh, my father actually was also in the kinder transport with Rabbi Dr. Schoenfeld. Um, mm. Anyway, um, so you mentioned something about Pole Gooda that caught my attention because my grandfather in Vienna was one of those people who did fund the Beis Yaakovs. And my grandmother, my father's mother, who had gone to university, I mean, it was a very educated family. She was so, she went to a Catholic school because there were no, there was no other education for girls. And so for the religious part, she was able to leave the classroom, but that was her education. And when the Beis Yaakov started, I don't, was there a Beis Yaakov in Vienna? I'm wondering if my aunts ever, there was Ever a Beis Yaakov in Vienna. Um, there, were, there were four Beis Yaakov seminaries. There was one in, the main one was in Krakow, and then there was one in Vienna. Um, and 
and there was one in, in Chernovitz that my mother went to, and then there was another one in Pressburg that was mostly just an evening program. But yeah, and Besiakov, there were Besiakovs in Germany too. Originally, they were mostly the children of Eastern European immigrants, and then kind of the more aristocratic, neo-Orthodox Jews started to send their daughters there too. Um, I just um, want to I say that when my mother went to Beisiakov in Pressburg, she was originally supposed to go to Beisiakov in Vienna, but after the Anschluss, they had to move it to Pressburg, which was across the Danube. And when my mother went to Beisiakov in Chernovitz, the teachers were expelled from Vienna and, came, and they came as teachers. I mean, she studied with Chava Landsberg, who later went to Jerusalem, that's Another right. a never married woman, I think. Yes, and my mother yes, studied right. someone named Miriam. Oh, no, was it Esther? Esther Hamburger Gross, who, which uh, I just thought of when you, you know, in, in Chernovitz, she was one of the teachers that was, that went, that came from, I, I don't know if it was Frankfurt or Vienna to teach in, in Chernovitz. Was well, the language of instruction German? as it was as people in Chernovitz spoke German. I know my aunt who went to Beis Yaakov in Chernovitz was in from a German speaking home. Very interesting. Hi, Nissan or Nissan, as I believe uh, is the correct pronunciation. Anyway, so um, the language of instruction, excellent question. The language of instruction, yes, was indeed German. You had, so my mother didn't know German. My mother was a Hungarian speaker at home. Mm -hmm. And she had to, it wasn't entirely German. So there were many teachers that taught in German, the ones who were brought in from Frankfurt and, and, and Vienna. Um, and then there were, uh, you know, the Skolena Rebbe would come in and give a little night lecture to the girls. And that was in Yiddish. Um, and there were also in the, in the Krakow Teacher Seminary, there were also less, there were also classes in Polish. Polish literature was taught in Polish. So, um, it, if in case your children are complaining about having to go to school in two languages, you can tell them about Besiakov in the interwar period. Also, but I want in to the, in the in the small Besiakovs in the small towns were were Yiddish were basically Yiddish. Naomi, I just want to mention that my mother was also in the Besiakov uh, with Rivka's um, mother in uh, and and uh, Chava Landsberg was her teacher and. Um, I was told that her father very much, my grandfather very much wanted her to go there to perfect her German because he had an yes, intuition was that it was important for the young people to know German because he saw what was coming and he understood the importance of not only speaking Hungarian but having a perfect, perfect Hochdeutsch which um, they spoke in, in Freshburg. And I, I just yeah. wanted to mention that um, I just found out now that um, Sarashnir's yard site is Khafba Vadar, which is actually today, the second um, I'm Adar. I'm sure it's, it's Adar Aleph, though. I it know, but, but it is Khafba Vadar. It is Khafba, yes, 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 right. And that is Mother's yard site, so I feel very touched that I, I made it to yes. I feel honored. Wow. Very wow. special. Yeah. And one of the, the, the whole German thing is very interesting because when yeah. we think of German neo-orthodoxy and as a kind of geographical phenomenon, but in Eastern Europe, in Beis Yaakov, it's as if from the same family, the boy would be, the girl would be more modern and more German than the boy because she went to a school that was so heavily influenced by modern Orthodox educators. Because the boys didn't have classes and diplomas and German, class, you know, report cards, and that, they weren't doing that in the yeshiva. That was only Beit Yaakov. Right. Well, it sounds and they, like today. <laughs> sounds and like today. Did, yeah. And they did Sorry. learn etiquette and um, uh, many, you know, many different things about, uh, you know, getting out into the world, and that was part of their um, grooming. And they learned Hebrew, which the boys also didn't yes. learn. Yes, yes, yes. My mother. Ivrit, they learned grammar, Ivris. Ivris, Beis Yaakov Ivris. Diktuk was very important. And to my mother, she, if we mispronounced a Hebrew word, like my daughter's name is Ayala, and it bothered her that it was, we didn't call her Ayala because she knew the Milel and the Milra from studying in, in Beis Yaakov. Yeah, in Beis Yaakov, I was told that my name is Noomi, which no one says anywhere else. But I actually have a whole theory about Beis Yaakov Hebrew because Beis Yaakov Hebrew is its own, no one pronounces Hebrew that way, like nobody. It combines 
grammar with, uh, you know, right? So mil el, mil ra, dagesh, all that, which of course the boys don't know anything about. They're very rarely taught that. With the kind, they don't do those kinds of Yiddish things. You'll never hear a Beis Yaakov girl say Beis Yankov. Her father might say that, her brother might say that, but no, Beis Yaakov girls don't say that. So, um, and they don't, they also don't say Taira, they say Torah. Um, so there's some, it's, it's a very, but they're also not speaking modern Israeli Hebrew, they're speaking Ivris. Um, and they're not speaking Lush and Kaidish. Um, someone out there should write a book just on Beis Yaakov Hebrew. I, I was under the impression that that came from Germany, from like the Frankfurt type it's of thing. It's true. Yeah. I think that it's it's very heavy, like so many other things. It's very hev heavily influenced by German. But if you listen to Germans, they have a slightly different um, mm -hmm. vowel. Like there's more like an owl. Yeah. yeah. It, it's yeah. just a little different. So it's like a hybrid kind of. The German is definitely part of it, but it's not the whole story. May I ask something? Um, my mother always regretted that she never went to uh, Beis Yaakov and she, she fails the lack of when she davens and when she reads the Parsha. She was from Leipzig um, and she did not go to a Jewish school, hmm. but they were Orthodox. They were always from. Um, as a matter of fact, my mother's mother wore something on her head where very few women did over there and her father was Polish. So when you mentioned the immigrant, was there no, nothing there? I mean, she was a little girl when the war started, so it, she wasn't up to seminary age, but I wonder if there was so ever there was, anything. Um, yeah, if they had been in Frankfurt, there were, she could have gone to the Real Shula. Right. And the, I'm pretty sure the Frankfurt, the Frankfurt Real Shula, which was started by Samson Rafael Hirsch. Um, she was in Leipzig. Right, the, so like I'm the, pretty sure they had some branches. Yeah. But they didn't have branches everywhere. And it was just traditional, like even very traditional families in Poland believed that, you know, the parents might have thought, you know, you're not allowed to teach the girl Torah or oh, she'll seems... learn at home or she'll learn with a tutor. Maybe. Right. So that, that yes. was the story. That was the story before Beis Yaakov, right? All these girls went right. to public school and then their parents somehow tried to give them a Jewish education anyway. They read the Tzanarena and that was sufficient. Exactly. They all read the Tzanarena and that's it. And they learned to read Hebrew, but they didn't learn Parsha. They didn't learn certainly nothing that we're learning today. But exactly. But, you know, there were exceptions. There were also kind of, um, you know, there were some schools. It was a school, Yehudia, which was also kind of modern Zionist. Oh, wow. Oh, I have to know more about Esther Hamburger Gross. I should put my email in the chat. But um, so uh, what was I saying? Oh, Yehudia, they taught girls learned on a very high level. So there were ways that girls could learn, but it, was, it wasn't it was a, and there was even another Orthodox girls school system in, in Poland called Chavat Selet that started a year before Beis Yaakov, but was only in Warsaw and its surroundings. So there were, there were Orthodox girls schools, but it was very patchy. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. I, as predicted, this conversation could go on for days and days. Um, we are happy to connect anyone with Naomi. If you have uh, family stories or additional questions, uh, Rifka and I would be happy to make the connection. So please let us know. Also, if you have friends that weren't able to join us tonight for the lecture, we did record this evening's program. And at some point tomorrow, it'll be available um, on our website. Naomi was kind enough to place her email address in the chat for those who want it. Um, Thank you to everybody for joining Can I say us. One we more thing I forgot to say very Absolutely. quickly. If you want to know more about Beis Yaakov, you're interested in following, I'm, I'm writing blogs and things like that. I have a website called the Beis Yaakov Project. So just check out the Beis Yaakov Project and you'll get more Beis Yaakov stuff. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor Seidman, for a wonderful evening. Thank you to Rifka and Elliot for sponsoring our program. Our Zoom will end right now. I want to thank you all for joining and have a wonderful, wonderful night.